Okay, we are going to start soon. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to day two of the Tectonic Formation Digital Futures Workshop Seminar. So uh, this seminar is a series of presentations that are coming from the RMIT Architecture Tectonic Formation Lab, which I direct. My name is Roland Snooks. And our research looks at the relationship between computational design and robotic fabrication and the way these come together to form innovative emergent tectonics. So most of our work is really about trying to evolve a set of um, tectonic principles, and a lot of this is around the compression of surface structure and ornament into an irreducible assemblage. Uh, today, um, we're gonna have three presentations, which are going to be um, Natalie Alima, who will be talking about biological materials and, and 3D printing. Um, Charlie Bowman, who's gonna be talking about some innovative work with uh, metal printing, in particular with wire arc additive manufacturing. And Nick Bow will be talking about his work which looks at the relationship between structural engineering and generative design. Before we get to that, I'm gonna begin by just talking very briefly about uh, a project that we're working on as part of Digital Futures. So yesterday uh, I gave an overview of the, um, of the work of the lab and I described how our work has progressed through a series of what we describe as agent body prototypes. And so these are a series of prototypes which are testing this relationship between computational design and robotic fabrication and looking at the consequence of those in terms of architectural tectonics. So part of this series of projects, um, we've attempted to, I guess, extend that with a project that we're currently working on as, as I said, as part of Digital Futures. So this is a small installation which is uh, made from concrete and it's something we describe as an agent body um, tectonic. And so the agent body is part of an ongoing research that we've been doing around um, a process that we've described as behavioral formation. So behavioral formation, and I described this in a lot more detail yesterday in yesterday's session, but behavioral formation is a generative process that draws from logical swarm intelligence and operates through multi-agent algorithms. And it's an approach in which we encode design intention into individual agents and through their interaction, a type of self-organized intention emerges. Uh, a lot of the, the work we do with this ends up being highly intricate and complex geometries. And so the role of the lab in many ways has been to develop tectonics that, and construction systems that allow us to build these types of geometries. In particular, the agent body is, is a sort of subset of this uh, algorithmic approach. And an agent body is a, um, it's a construct which is uh, a piece of geometry, it has a series of limbs and each of those limbs are encoded with agency. And so in this case, the agent body is able to reach out and connect to other agent bodies around it. And what this means is that the agent body is able to make continuous uh, lines of, of structure and ornamental effects, but each body becomes unique. So although each body may well have a, a very similar uh, core to other bodies around it, um, every body becomes un unique through its, um, its connection and adjacent to surrounding um, agents. So this is the logic we're using for this project um, that we're currently building at Tonji University. Um, this is being fabricated by innovative Chinese construction company. And what we're looking at is the way we can deal with a combination of repetition and unique parts in the project. So there's two levels of agency that work in terms of generative process in this project. So there's uh, a multi-agent system, which is working with these agent bodies that deal with the distribution of, of the bodies and the way the bodies connect to each other. And you can see in this image, the connections are, um, are defined by these joints, which are mechanically fixed. And they're mechanically fixed so that they can be um, disassembled and reassembled. The second level of agency is these final level of, um, of line work, these ridges that you see on the, on the agent bodies themselves. And so this is an, a multi-agent strand system uh, where agents are moving across the surface and they're generating a series of, um, of grooves or of, um, of ridges, which give a, a second level of articulation to the project. And one of the ambitions that we're trying to work on with this project is to try and get a sort of synthetic relationship between the two. Um, so there's sort of a correlation between the overall form of the project and its, um, its fine grain 
patination. So this is one of the first prototypes um, that was developed in the last month for the project. Um, and we were testing different forms, but also the relationship between the form and articulation of these components. Now this draws on a series of projects we've done over the last, well, I guess going back now about six years, where we're looking at the relationship between 3D printing and cast concrete. So this, these were our first attempts in 2016 where we were 3D printing what we describe as a sacrificial formwork. It's a type of permanent mold where we, um, we print a surface and then we cast um, concrete back into it. And our original intention for this was to create these types of um, highly intricate structural lattices. This is one of those prototypes. But the ambition with this work was always to maintain the, the surface as a type of permanent mold. Um, so this had a, a relationship between skin and what we saw as reinforcing structure within these projects. What we're doing uh, as part of Digital Futures is something a little bit different. We're using uh, a more traditional mold technique in some ways where the mold is um, is a temporary mold. It's a, a mold that's cast into and then it's removed. And so this gives has certain limitations. Um, it has certain limitations around repetition and certain limitations around the types of geometries that can be uh, can be produced because of the, the draft angles of those molds. But then it also enables us to uh, have certain efficiencies because we're reusing the mold and we're able to create um, a lot of repetition at you know very sort of feasible um, a feasible process through a feasible process. So this is um, one of the first prototypes, and as you can see, it's um it's printed on a very different type of printer to our last projects. Instead of using uh, a large industrial robot, this is being printed on a more conventional sort of desktop style three D printer. Uh, FDM printer. And this is the first prototype that you can see that was cast from that mold. Now this draws on, I guess, a logic we've been working on before with, uh, with molds and repetition. And I guess a lot of our work has been around trying to either um, uh, supersede the mold or somehow do without a mold or look at the repetition within molds and the way that contributes to the architectural language of the project. So you can see in this image, uh, we're labeling with three different colors, and that's because there are three different types of agent bodies in this. Um, parts of those molds are reused. And this comes back to a logic we began to think about on this project. This is about seven years ago now, a uh, composite wing project. And in this project, there were several, there were eight pieces. Um, five of them had double curvature. And in order to limit the amount of mold making we're doing for the project, we didn't try and make a mold for each of those five parts we made one mold that was then reused to create each of those parts. Um, so you can see in this diagram, uh, the dark, the, the gray is the, the form of the mold. And then each of those parts has a different profile cut off that mold. And what that means is there's a repetition of formal language, but you don't see the same, you don't see the same part repeated. Um, so in this project, we're doing something a little bit different. We're doing something where each of the parts is deliberately recognizable, and we do that in order to generate a certain type of, um, of emergent order, or sort of that is evident through the repetition of those. But where the difference occurs is actually between each of these elements. So there are certain parts which are repeated, which is sort of the core of the body, and then the, the connecting parts between these become custom elements. I'll explain how this works. So, there's two iterations of this project. We're going to be making uh, initially a type of prototype, which consists of three bodies, and then we'll be making a larger construct, which is consists of 19 bodies. So in the three body model, we have two different um, body types. So this is body type one, and you can see that the red is what we describe as the core. And then in the beige, you can see these five different, what we describe as standard legs. Uh, and the slightly different body for number two, this is, the body is effectively thicker. It's dealing with conditions where there's greater structural loads on the part. But they're quite simple, they're quite similar. So this is our, our model for the three body prototype. Uh, so you can see here P05, this is a, a body type two and part zero one and zero two, these are a body type ones. And you can see where they connect. And so what ends up happening with these is there are some standard limb elements standard core elements and custom connecting elements. 
So this means for each of these parts, um, we can reuse the, the red and the yellow parts here, and it's only the purple which has to be um, 3D printed as a unique part for that particular connection. So that's, and then it's part two and part three. So this is the kind of documentation that we delivered to the, um, the fabricator. Uh, we're effectively delivering something which is um, the standard parts, which are these, which then the molds are printed for, and then delivering this type of documentation, which is describing you know, where the part is, um, which different standardized parts to be connected, and which custom parts to then connect those links. So this is the, um, the mold for one of those parts. Um, as you can see, it's in, in several elements. So the main core is printed in, uh, in two parts, uh, and then it has the addition of the five legs. Now, this is a different type of logic to what we've been working on recently with some of our polymer printed projects. This is a project we exhibited 18 months ago at the Shenzhen Architecture Biennale. And I guess one of the key differences is these projects that we've been working on with plastic um, have a very different relationship between fabrication and the design logic. So in both these projects, we're using agent bodies and those agent bodies are connected to each other in a customized way. I guess the difference is in the current project we're doing in, at Tonji University, the agent bodies are um, articulated as separate bodies and actually fabricated as separate bodies. Whereas in this project, you can see this is one of the parts. This is, a, this is for a subsequent project we're currently working on, a similar logic. One of the parts is printed based on the logic of printing, not on the logic of the agent body. So this is effectively a piece that's been trimmed out of a larger assemblage and printed. And so in this case, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the agent body as, uh, as a generative tool or as a, um, a geometric tool and the fabrication component. Whereas what we're doing in Atonji is each of these individual bodies is articulated as such. It, they're articulated as um, a separate element. And so in this way, I guess all our projects have a, some sort of blurring relationship between the continuous and the discrete. And so, for example, in the previous project, plastic projects I was showing, uh, they deliberately try and blur and probably sit more on a, a spectrum of, the, of continuity. Whereas these projects are more clearly uh, articulating the discrete elements, the discrete individual components. But of course, you know, key to this is the, the bit that gives it continuity, which is the, um, the customized connection. Between them. So this is um, the three body part will be fabricated over the next couple of days. And um, this is one of those, one of those final um, prototype components, which will then be um, mechanically fixed to its two neighbors. Okay, so with that, um, that was just to kind of give a sort of brief overview of the other thing that we're doing at Digital Futures. So of course we're we're working on um, on that project and this uh, short seminar series. So with that, I would like to hand over to Natalie Alima. Natalie is one of the PhD candidates within the Tectonic Formation Lab at RMIT. Um, and so Natalie, um, thank you very much and over to you. Hey, Sean. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, everyone can see the screen? Yeah, we can see that fine, Natalie. Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Natalie Lima. I'm a PhD candidate and researcher for um, Roland Snooks at RMIT. Um, today I'm just gonna give a brief overview about the things that I'm really interested in, uh, what I contribute to the lab and my current research trajectory. Um, so my PhD title and research is titled The Tension Between Biological Agency and the Architect's Design Aesthetic. Uh, and this research really explores methodologies that extend design agency to the non-human. So by enabling this interspecies design, each project really explores the negotiation of the architect's design aesthetic and biological agency through form. So within nature, nothing is still. There is a constant evolution of a time-based growth process and form. 
So in order to embrace these characteristics within architecture, I really invite nature to become a co-creator within the design process. Uh, so for this PhD research, I've been working with mycelium. Mycelium is a fibrous fruit of mushroom. Its chemical characteristics include its ability to act as a natural binder and adopt any geometry provided. Uh, fungi digest its surroundings in order to obtain energy and nutrients. It therefore grows by releasing enzymes from its tips, resulting in intricate tapestries of growth, as you can see in this image over here. So when I refer to the mycelium's agency, this research is concerned with mycelium's fibr fibrous root system and its structural capabilities. So rather than relating to nature for its form, similar to the process of biomimicry, this research um, is concerned with converting scientific observational knowledge into an, a language for architects to design with. This research is therefore explores both a design that responds to mycelia's properties of growth and a design that responds to the organism's structural properties. Um, so this research really focuses on mycelia's properties of growth and, and how it responds to form. So the first project that I'll present here is called Biosaffolds. Uh, Biosaffolds explores the robotic reading and infusion of liquefied mycelium into a series of biodegradable scaffolds. This research explores the orchestration of fungi growth by fabricating biological enclosures for the organism to inhabit. In response to mycelium's micro patterns of growth when searching for nutrients, these heterogeneous skins orchestrate the growth and decay of mycelia through computational form and robotic intervention. By fusing robotic fabrication with living materials, I've been investigating the innovative technologies occurring within the biomedical industry, which include tissue engineering, uh, printing artificial organs and bioscaffolds. Specifically, I've been investigating the process of the medical bioscaffold. And through this investigation, I've been interested in how these methodologies of biodegradability and biocompatibility make her outside the human body and be applied to the architectural discipline. So similar to the medical biosaffold, which I've just showed, uh, my sling is able to biodegrade through a range of fibrous forms in order to seek nutritious substrates. And through this research, I've discovered that mycelium is actually attracted to the fibrous properties contained within a wood-based PLA filament. And it therefore has the ability to degrade any given mold provided. Um, as a result, I've been 3D printing a range of complex geometries with this fibrous filament and infusing them with a liquefied culture of mycelium. The prototype was then left to incubate as mycelium successfully began to grow and degrade the designated areas throughout the scaffold, as seen in this image over here. So with the intention of designing for decay and death, a series of computational intricate skins were generated that encouraged mycelia growth and scaffold degradation. Design for non-human applications, so design for mycelia rather than uh, human-centric applications, these biological habitats manipulate the natural phenomena of life through computational and robotic intervention. Uh, so through a process of color detection, I've developed an approach where data is extracted from mycelium through robotically controlled scanning and sampling. And through developed feedback systems, the robot was then enabled to verify which areas of the mycelium were living and which areas were dying, um, as demonstrated in this diagram over here. This occurred by robotically probing the mycelium with an Arduino moisture sensor, and in reaction to the value received, it would then rotate to inject additional uh, mycelium culture, as you can see in this robotic syringe we developed here as part of the lab's research. So during the course of the mycelium's development, the bacterial and symbiotic tension between machine and organism became apparent, transforming these biodegradable scaffolds into enclosures for the mycelium to thrive and eventually adopt its overall geometry. So by documenting the organism's reaction to each geometry, I discovered that its ideal form for successful degradation is something quite fibrous, such as intricate lattice systems providing pathways for the organism to latch onto and see through, as shown in this um, image over here, the mycelium degrading the entire lattice system. So with this knowledge, I generate a series of lattice systems 
that would encourage the growth of mycelium and scaffold degradation. In order to orchestrate a process of growth and decay through form, a series of skins were designed, were designed that would both discourage biological growth in the smooth areas and encourage growth within the lattice systems. So you can see the split system here that would both encourage biological growth over here and discourage biological growth in the smooth areas. So um, advancing this, this design concept, the two design languages of encouraging and hindering growth through form were fused together through four different algorithmic strategies. Through a, through a sequential feedback system, each form was fabricated and injected with mycelium in order to examine the organism's response to the generated form. Critiquing the results of growth, the forms evolved in complexity and detail over, over time. Uh, developed by Roland Snooks, this first algorithm presented here, painted forms, draws upon the logic of swarm intelligence and multi-agent uh, multi processes. These computational forms were 3D printed out of the fibrous wooden filament and infused with mycelium. So according to the experiment's results, the organism mostly reacted to the lattice-like areas for successful degradation, as you can see in these moments over here. With this knowledge in mind, the second iteration of this design was further developed in order to further enhance these features of feather-like strands, resulting in a gradient of elongated fibrous strands with non-indexical forms. So these uh, new iterations were then 3D printed and tested with the organism. Evident in these images here, the mycelin creates a web-like structure branching from each digitally fabricated antenna. These results were examined in order to inform the next design iteration, which further exaggerated these design features. Oops, something's wrong here. Oh, there you go. Um, so these forms have been 3D printed and will soon be inoculated with mycelium. So by researching through design, each form has evolved according to the results observed from the mycelium inoculation. And due to this recursive feedback system, a catalogue of forms is produced, advancing complexity in detail over time. With the second algorithm implemented, differential growth, form is growing through an algorithmic process, which is actually not dissimilar to the patterns of growth as seen in nature. The forms generated showcase a clear juxtaposition between the lattice areas for mycelial growth with a smooth core. These forms were 3D printed and inoculated with mycelium. So from examining these results, currently I'm computationally mutating these skins in order to further enhance these highly articulated areas for mycelial growth. Based on a logic of, distrib of a distrib distribution of meshes, the third algorithm generated array cells across the designated surface. And these forms have been 3D printed and are currently being inoculated with mycelium. With an understanding of how mycelium could react to these forms, I've been testing a number of geometries with these intricate skins that could further enhance the organism's behavior. The final algorithm of the series, differential curve growth, is based on generating curves adapting to a surface. Currently, these forms are being robotically fabricated and infused with mycelium. So the aim of this research outcome isn't actually to produce one finalized form, but rather a catalog of geometries showcasing contrasting biological patterns of growth. Uh, whilst initially the algorithms were developed according to the architect's aesthetic, the observation of biological growth disrupts the design process through a sequential feedback system between architectural and biological agencies. So when critiquing this research, although this research of the bioscaffolds is gener generated for the orchestration of micromycelia growth, I began to question what would the results on form B if this research was scaled up to macro building applications? And how does the design process change when the client is human, but still accommodate for nature within the form making process? Uh, Bioforms, my next project that I'll present here, explores my silly structural agency in application of biodegradable wall systems. This project was uh, completed in co collaboration with Roland Snooks, who was the head designer, and Hassan Mohammed. So 
Whilst many designers have utilized my stone within the building scale for its structural capabilities, a sacrificial form of system has yet to be explored. Rather than disposing of the molds created for mycelium, as the majority of these existing projects do, this research intends to grow the external architectural skin and internal mycelium core as one unified system. Um, so utilizing zero petrochemicals, this research is based on the logic of having 3D printed skins and out of a wood-based filament with the mycelium internal core. This sandwich panel system is 100% biodegradable and intended to replace existing petrochemical wall systems with foam insulation. As previous research has discovered, mycelium not only has structural capabilities in compression, but also has the ability to absorb sound. This concept of 3D printing um, internal wall systems was actually originally derived from Roland Snook's Building 515 project. Um, so fusing this project with my research of the bi-scaffolds, Biforms was born as a way to host mycelia growth, act as a structural component for internal walls and absorb sound. This linear feedback system is based on observing the characteristics of mycelia structural agency and reflect upon this research through design. So catering uh, to these constraints, Biforms was designed with a large internal void for mycelium to grow. In comparison to building 515, mycelium takes majority of the compressive strength of the wall, enabling a thinner external skin. For tensile strength, external passageways were designed in order to house fibrous composites, which cross over each other throughout the entire surface. In comparison to the highly intricate details of the bioscaffolds, the internal void of bioforms has actually little, little geometry for the mycelium to latch onto. So in order to increase my silly growth and stability, currently I'm designing this design to emphasize a higher articulation of form, as you can see here. So addressing what was not successful in the first design iteration, these intricate skins are designed to further enhance fungi growth. Whilst these are revised geometries showcase a higher resolution of form for my slim to grow into, it still maintains a balance to be utilized within building applications. So for the next design iteration, these intricate wall panel systems will be 3D printed out of a wood-based filament at a larger building scale. So when reflecting upon this project, there is obviously a clear dominance of an architectural aesthetic when negotiating uh, form. This next project and the fall, uh, last project that I'll present, Biofeedback, explores a stronger influence of biological agency through cyclic feedback systems. So this project by feedback considers how material, biological growth and design aesthetic all contribute to the creation of form. So exploring a rejection of the dichotomies between human and nature, by feedback explores a true hybrid between design and mycelia agendas of form. In this approach, I explore techniques in which nature's data is transformed into architectural drawings, computational forms and living prototypes. Exploring my silly's fibrous growth network generated when digesting its surroundings on the nanoscale, this research um, aims to computationally visualize and manipulate these molecular root systems in real time. Through a process of edge detection and data driven computational workflow, I was enabled to track, extract, and computationally map the mycelium's patterns of growth. This was achieved through vision systems that trace around the mycelium's polylines in order to computationally visualize the organism's intricate forms. So by computationally mapping the physical materials growth in real time, a series of beautifully intricate drawings were produced, representing the mycelium's true design aesthetic. Whilst this stream of research establishes systems which enable biological materials to generate form, it is truly concerned with the relationship between human and non-human agencies, so between nature and architects. It is therefore imperative that the architect's design aesthetic remains a contributor within the form planning process. So in order to uh, fuse the architect's design aesthetic and unrestrained nature of mycelium, an additional computational agent was generated, utilizing the mycelium's agency as a blueprint. So by hybridizing both the computational and biological agencies, a new hybrid is created, which is neither human or nature. 
Um, in order to 3D print these geometries with the mycelium medium, clay was utilized, um, which acts as a structural binder for the living fibers to adhere to. Um, be, being a biological medium, these living extrusions uh, thrive off the clay's organic binders and adapted according to the uh, geometry provided. I'll just go back to this slide over here. So acting as a mediator between human and organism, robotic feedback systems are implemented in order to transmit nature's information, uh, enabling an architectural design response. So being a meeting ground for both agencies, the machine extracts data from mycelium growth in order to computationally visualize its fibrous network. This input of information acts as a catalyst for a set of algorithmic rules and forms to be generated. Um, so, design, so design outputs are robotically extruded with the mycelium medium, becoming inputs for biological growth. So this process of scanning and extruded was, uh, extruding was repeated every 48 hours. And as a result, a series of two-dimensional intricate screens and tapestries expose a tapestry of growth between mycelium and design agencies. So this specific aesthetic of mycelium growth is only visible on the micro scale, as this fibrous root system actually often gets lost within the bulk of material if scaled up. So complementing the scale, the architectural intervention of this research remains at the micro level in order to further enhance mycelium's fibrous growth aesthetic. So my, with my research, I really present a catalog of digitally fabricated forms which are generated from this feedback system between um, robotic fabrication and computational form. Um, and I really partner, I, I partner my research with a series of photographs and time-lapse models, which complement this um, and document this feedback system between uh, robotic fabrication and biological materials. So I'm just gonna end my presentation there. Um, I'll stop sharing screen. Um, so thanks for listening to my presentation, everybody. If you'd like to see further information regarding my research, please follow the Digital Tectonic Lab Instagram. Um, and now I'm going to present Charlie, who's going to present uh, his research. So Charlie, please take it away. No worries. Thanks a lot, Nat. I'll just share my screen. Um, you guys can just confirm that you can see it. That'd be great. Okay. All good? Yep. All right. Um, hello, my name is um, Charlie Bowman, and I'm a research assistant within the Tectonic Formation Lab at RMIT University. And I've been involved um, primarily with um, the lab's research into the development of 3D printed um, uh, tectonic forms, um, mostly my experiences with polymers, but we've recently started branching out into um, WAM, which is uh, wire arc additive manufacturing processes. Um, but the lab actually has a bit of a lineage um, with metal prior to um, when I joined. Um, one of the earlier projects that um, the lab was involved with was actually um, with sintering um, powdered based metal um, manufacturing. Um, this project that we're looking at here is um, a mace or like a section of a mace that was commissioned by RMIT and produced through uh, the lab. Um, and you guys will probably have a look at this and you can recognize the um, agent um, segment agent processes that Roland was showing off earlier on in his presentation, evident in this one here. And then following up from that, a very similar um, project, but this was uh, produced for the Centre Pompidou. Um, it's in their permanent collection, and it's actually a um, small version of a conceptual idea, I guess, that um, Roland came up with for this bridge here, this project, Nine Elms um, Street Bridge project. Um, so as you guys can probably see here, the, um, the earlier sintering te um, technology produces obviously very, very small, very um, high resolution objects. And for a long time, the lab um, just kind of like stuck with the assumption that we would be a while off um, being able to produce these things at um, you know, architectural scale. 
Um, however, I guess in the past year or so, we've kind of come to the realization that maybe we're not actually as far away from um, this being a reality as we thought. And I'm going to try and sort of demonstrate that uh, through the discussion of two projects the lab has recently uh, completed as part of an I IMCRC um, collaboration, um, which we collaborated with UAP and QUT over. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is um, this facade prototype that we did for Design Week. Um, and we call this the substrate prototype essentially because um, as you guys can see, it's a hybrid between um, folded metal substrates and WAM um, printing in the center there. And this one was actually quite a fascinating process to work on here just because of the amount of um, variables that this one throws out. So um, we basically went into this one with the assumption that this would be a good starting point um, because we weren't entirely sure about, I guess, the speed at which um, WAM printing could actually operate. So we weren't entirely convinced that we could manufacture this entire thing out of WAM printing. Um, and so this was kind of like an intermediate strategy. However, um, I think we became more confident in the capabilities of WAM um, following the post of this one. So these are just some um, early uh, development studies here where we were slowly trying to figure out exactly how um, do we print onto the substrate. These were actually um, performed by um, Alec, a gentleman called Alec Walter. He was um, my predecessor in, for this project um, and spent pretty much uh, the majority of two years just nailing the um, printing parameters basically and getting um, better and better results as he kind of moved along so that we could be really confident in um, producing stable and high quality prints. So as you can see here, we're slowly getting a little bit better as we move along until finally, you know, Alex got the settings down to the point where we could confidently um, print this stuff onto, um, onto a three millimeter edging here. So basically incredibly precise and incredibly consistent um, deposition. And this actually became um, more important to the project than we um, initially thought. Like this was um, a, just an early demonstration of whether we could or whether we couldn't print to um, a level, like um, high precision. Um, but what we what you will find is that obviously when you are printing onto substrates, the amount of heat that you put into the substrate will cause it to warp and to form. So if I go back, you guys can see that part of the strategy that we used to try and mitigate this was to add folds along um, the direction of where that warpage was going to be taking place. And um, eventually uh, um, cross Roland's mind as a question of, well, why don't we just print directly onto the folds as well and sort of uh, and blend it that way so that we can um, mitigate the amount of warpage that would be occurring on these prints and at the same time create a detail out of it. So that's what we went for and that was the ambition. Um, so as you guys can see here, um, with the WAM printing started taking off, um, we started getting more um, consistent prints. Um, however, it wasn't up to a quality, I guess that like, we, we try to, we hold quality to a real high esteem in the lab. So um, even though this technically was, you know, creating the form of it, we um, felt like we could definitely push it um, further in terms of the um, quality of the output. And what we found was that um, it had less to do with the settings. Um, so Alex developed the settings to this point where we were um, confident that we were getting stable and consistent prints. Um, and so we started questioning, um, how can we actually garner better quality out of this um, if we already accept the fact, like accepting the fact that um, the settings could not be improved much further than they already are. And so it became um, for us a question of methodology of like, how do we develop the pathing? So a lot of this was produced um, in the early stages with three axis. Um, we started interrogating whether five axis would uh, produce um, better outcomes. And so hopefully this is going to play, we shall see. So like this is a video of the early studies of us moving into five axis printing.
And as you can see, the robot has to be um, pretty acrobatic in order to accomplish that. I can hear, still hear it, sorry. Just give me a second while I pause it. Hmm. Apologies, the video for some reason won't stop. There we go. Um, and what we saw was a marked improvement in the quality that we're getting out of um, the deposition. And part of the reasoning behind this, we felt, was because through um, using five axis, we were able to create a more sympathetic relationship between how the robot behaved, how it deposited material, and the um, design, like the geometry input. Um, second part of the problem, though, was that the substrate itself was being um, created manually for a large portion of it. So it was being laser cut, but then it was being folded by hand, which meant that there was actually a large um, deviation in the location from the digital model to the real world um, location. So we had to come up with a bunch of strategies in order to get precise um, locations of where these things were going to be in order to um, have the robot accurately deposit onto them. And this is just another photo outlining um, how I guess important it was that um, the digital model and the real world output lined up. Um, as you can see here, these sub um, substrates have three um, pin joints on them. And um, this was a fairly early one. I think, I believe we got some much closer tolerance, but this was actually um, a marked improvement from what we were producing earlier on. Uh, so, uh, we were actually pretty encouraged by this um, and believed that, all right, so we can now print like fairly high quality prints at the moment. And they're also um, printing out um, fairly accurate to the digital model as well. And I'm just gonna play this video as well. So this will just run through the full um, process for you guys. So as you can see, there is, um, that's the substrate being folded. All right. And then uh, we basically just went through a process of um, trying to figure out how we were going to finish these things. So what kind of um, finish quality did we want to have onto it um, with the end result being that we sandblasted all the pieces and then buffed and polished and sanded them. Um, the pieces were actually hand welded together, uh, which is something that we kind of had to um, give into because of time constraints to do this. This project actually was completed in a little under two weeks, um, which was encouraging for us because um, we actually were, we were pretty convinced we could get these assembly, like one of these assemblies done every single day, which was a lot quicker than we thought um, WAM printing would be capable of doing. Um, so it was encouraging to know that WAM printing could actually work to what we believe was um, a commercially viable speed. Um, but yeah, there wasn't enough time to try and work out a decent strategy of how to join these two separate parts together. So they were hand welded. Um, however, we do believe that there would be a, a, a method where we could have had the robot um, join these things together and um, give, a, I guess, a more precise and cleaner join between the two. So these are just some further photos of it. Um, so the second um, project that we move into, which we call the layer by layer um, process, um, is basically the, the primary difference is one, we aren't using um, a substrate hybrid. So the WAM printing in itself is the entirety of the project. Uh, but the second aspect of it is that we've moved on from surface geometry into shell-based geometry. So the um, WAM printing was going to be producing um, closed forms or closed paths, um, which we were pretty familiar with with plastic printing. Um, but we, this is the first time that we'd actually attempted it with metal. Uh, our partner, sorry, not our partners, um, 
Our friends over at the University of Wollongong actually um, produced this for us as a prototype in Switch. Um, so they've been developing WAM printing uh, as well. Um, and they said that this one took about 40 hours or so. Um, so this was basically proof of concepts. We um, knew that it could be done. So we had to set out and try and do it ourselves now. So in the early stages, we again, were just printing um, three axis printing. And as you can see, we're getting fairly stable, consistent results. Um, but these prints were just straight up extrusions. And when we started getting into difficulty was when we started getting into more complex um, draft and more extreme draft angles. Um, and as you can see, this started becoming a big mess. So what we had to do was obviously move back into using five axes, but we had to completely rethink the way that the five axis was actually running um, in comparison to how we ran it with the surface printing. Uh, there were a bunch of inherent um, difficulties that we had, or hadn't come across when we were doing surface-based printing that we were now encountering when we were using closed loop pathing. Um, and as you can see here, here's one of them um, where you're getting um, a pretty big tear that's coming through that, an unintentional tear. Um, layer heights started to um, massively deviate from each other. And this is a huge problem for um, additive, like wire arc additive manufacturing, uh, which relies on, a high, like it's dependent on a high degree of um, precision. Um, you don't get a large amount of um, tolerance between these. Um, and this is one of the, this is just a diagram outlining the reason why. So as you can see here, as the robot is moving around um, and tra like trying to accomplish um, that sympathy towards the underlying geometry, um, it can um, in doing so create uh, opportunities for like, you know, as we can see here, we've got a bit of buildup happening over here. And um, unfortunately, just because of the acute angle of the print of the five axis printing, you will start getting holes and start getting tears and everything like that. So um, in a way you want to try and sort of map, like you've got these two didactic considerations that you're constantly trying to um, uh, calibrate between each other, the desire for the robot to follow the underlying form as much as possible and um, order to, um, in order to avoid the kind of rifts and holes that you get when you are doing three axis printing. Um, but at the same time, you've got to try and make sure that there is enough precision and enough um, stability in the print as you're going along so that in trying to accomplish that goal, um, it doesn't create more errors. So we learned a lot through um, this one um, and spent a large amount of time developing up the method by which we um, calculate the path, calculate the direction um, of the TCP. And so this is us starting um, our endeavors to kind of replicate the thing that uh, the uh, University of Wollongong did for us. And you know, this was a pretty big milestone for us. We hadn't done one, we hadn't printed anything yet where um, parts, paths had joined together and bifurcated. So I'm um, pretty happy when that happened and it happened successfully and cleanly. And this was another big milestone when two paths are starting to come together and bridge together. Um, but as you can see, there are some subtle errors still kind of like sliding into uh, this print as it's being developed. However, um, the more that we printed it, the more we kind of overcame them and adjusted the script. One of the really great things about WAM printing is that you do have um, the ability to just pause a print, go away for a couple of days, work on the code and come back and just um, start again um, right from where you left it with no real noticeable damage or anything like that to the quality of the print. And so this was it starting to enter into its final stage. Here we have a couple of photos of um, the final output of this. Um, as you can see, uh, I, like the University of Wollongong all compliments to them for um, their ability to print an incredibly complex form right off the bat. Um, we do, uh, like, we chose to go for much lower settings, much more stable settings. So we feel like the quality on this one is improved, but it does come with the sacrifice of the amount of time that it takes to actually print it. So overall, this project, this particular um, project took about 
five, six days to do. Although I think if we calculated up the total um, print time in order to do it, we would probably be around the 40 hour mark in order to do that. And so that re actually raised a um, pretty interesting um, conundrum for us here. Um, one where we realized that um, the amount of time that actually goes into the project is incredibly dependent on the kind of geometry that you are um, constructing. So with the surface-based geometry, we were able to pump out um, or like, uh, like the deposition rate was able to produce that form in like, you know, a matter of days, whereas this single one took several days in order to accomplish. And the only difference between them was one was a closed bit of geometry and the other one was single surface. So these are just some more photos from various angles of it. Um, so looking forward into the future, we obviously want to keep on developing um, this style of printing. And in fact, we have, we're working on another project currently that will basically take very similar kind of geometry, but we're gonna scale it up by about 50%. So it'll be much larger. Um, and we're actually gonna have an opportunity to try and see um, how structurally sound is going to work with that one. So that one we're all pretty excited about. Uh, Looking forward, we're also intrigued about the potential for WAM printing to, uh, we're calling this dot printing essentially. So to do um, very fine um, sort of strand like behaviors is another example of, well, here's a further example, more testing ground into this one here. Um, so I just wanna end on this image again, um, just because I think ha coming full circle back to this one um, and highlighting again how uh, pri like previous, like about a couple of years ago, if we looked at this and um, we asked, you know, how, is this feasible? Is this something that could actually exist in the world? Um, we probably would have been fairly skeptical that it could um, in any any time soon. However, I completely have 360. I don't see any reason why um, this, in fact, couldn't be built tomorrow. It would take some time, um, and definitely you would want to have more than just one robot. But in terms of uh, the technology, in terms of the capacity to create this formwork um, at scale, out of metal, um, I think that's um, completely and totally feasible. Um, so I'll finish there. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, Nick Bao uh, is going to present now, so I'll pass it over to him. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Over to you, Nick. Let me just stop sharing. Thank you, Charlie. Um, can you hear me? We can hear yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. And we can see your screen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Bao from MIT University School of Architecture and Urban Design. Um, I'm the member of the Tectonic Formation Lab and the lecturer in architecture at MIT. Um, the topic on today, I want to talk about Swan Bissell. Um, which is part of my research. Um, it is about the performance driving digital architecture design and intelligent construction. So the background um, motiva uh, motivation and problems of my research I come from the three aspects, inspiration by nature rules, a collaboration between architects and engineers, and the lost connection between architecture aesthetics and the structure performance simultaneously. So my research um, is mainly about algorithm for uh, functional intricate form and mass customization uh, manufacturing strategies. So um, like the picture showing the precedence of the historical building like Gothic building and the, um, the, the Gaudi's church. And nowadays um, the smart lab uh, from ETH and the fiber pavilion from ICD and I2KE. Um, in my mind, the, the form from nature um, especially like the nature structures, um, which can balance the aesthetics and the performance, which can be transferred into architecture aesthetics and the architecture uh, structure performance. So um, from the form from nature, so how can computer can um, make the form from nature or generate the nature form uh, rationally? Um, Back to the early stage of my PhD, 
Um, well, one of my supervisor, Professor Mike Shear, proposed a simulation of Apple uh, ship optimization. And uh, um, my another uh, supervisor, Professor uh, Rulas Lux, also proposed the, um, the Swan Intelligent um, method applied on the architecture design. So both of their research, BSO and the Swan Intelligent Architecture, um, have, have been applied um, on the architecture form finding for, um, for many years. Um, so before I started my PhD study, I divide my research into three stages um, from the, um, the theory and the method and the application. So um, the theory is from the, um, the loose-based uh, design approach, this one intelligent form finding. And another one is a stru structure optimization method. Um, use the BESO method to do the uh, architecture form finding. Then I'm going to integrate in the digital, uh, digital, method, the digital design methods. Um, so the method is, um, um, there's two approaches. And when, one is the micro approach, which I call it as swan saw. Another one is the micro approach, which is the mostly as aging bodies. But today I wanna, I'm going to talk about uh, the swan saw. Um, and for the application, um, for the application, um, I use the um, I collaborate with the team and um, use the uh, the the uh, facility at MIT um, University um, Architecture School. Use the um, robotics and mainly use the um, effective manufacturing uh, strategies to deliver um, some um, architectural prototypes, including the um, clay concrete print. Um, plastic print um, and the metal print. I also designed some big pavilion um, in the past few years um, and also the, the bridge design. So for the new method of the swan so um, it's the new algorithm which is um, developed from the um, BESO methods. So the normal B, so the normal BSO method proposed by um, Mike Shear 20 years ago, like this structure design, project design by myself and the team has won the first prize. So you can see the material is being removed step by step, but um, it's also keep, still keep the similar uh, structure performance. Um, so I'm de uh, we're developing the Swan BSO based on the basic logic of the BSO and integrate with the uh, FEA model and multi-aging um, behaviors. So here's the, the diagram uh, showing how I um, use the um, FEA method to integrate the multi-agent um, um, algorithm um, to modify the, the new elements for the material property. Um, then give the multi-agent the structure uh, loose behavior. Um, um, so here is the, the next is the um, diagram showing the algorithm structures. It is integrating the FEA and MAS systems, the training the agents move to the new position to create a new FEA model. So all the algorithms is um, all written in the Python platform. And we test on the, um, we test on the um, 2D cantilevers. Then we fix the, the, the left part and put the loading on the right part. Um, so here is the, then we run the swan so uh, algorithm. So here is the first um, uh, best result we tested. So you can see the aging is moving according to the uh, structural performance. So um, here is the um, different testing. Uh, you can see the different, uh, different uh, results using the different parameters. Um, then we move to the 3D um, um, cantilever uh, for testing. Um, so this research aims to explore a real-time structural behavior feedback loop in the process of designing intricate functional forms through the encoding BSO logic structure loops into the multi-agent algorithm. So this is the um, different steps of the uh, multi uh, swan BSO progress. Then later, um, we um, develop into a 3D um, short cantilever using the twisting load. 
Um, so here is the result um, of the, the swarm we, we saw on the uh, short 3D cantilever using the twisting nodes. So the, um, the result, result is quite um, different from the, the one, uh, just put, it, put one um, loading towards the ground. So we already published a paper on the uh, Kajura 2021 um, of the, this algorithm. So how is the possibility of the architecture design using the swarm BSO algorithm? Um, we also use the um, MIT Architecture Robotic Lab um, for the large 3D printing um, techniques um, using the um, clay, concrete, the a polymer, and the wine printing to realize um, the algorithm results. So I want to talk I want to start from the first project um, uh, from my PhD uh, study. So it's called Xform 1.0. So you can see the, um, the, the animation showing um, the material is removing from a column system, which the results quite looks like um, the trace is, tree branch assistance. Um, then this, this is just a part of uh, a quarter of the, the pavilion model. Then um, when we uh, do a mirror of the, the columns at becoming uh, the full uh, pavilion, you can see it quite looks like a uh, Gaudi's church. Um, so here is the um, iteration steps, the key iteration steps. So we use it, we use the BSO to create the pavilion and uh, um, also the experimental of the integrate topology optimization and robotic fabrication. So firstly, we test a small scale 3D printing model. Then we move to the large scale, um, um, large scale uh, 3D printer um, using the KUKA robots. Um, so we use the KUKA robots 3D printing setup at MIT University, um, uh, directed by Roland Snooks, um, used, uh, to print the column. So the robotic is, um, you, uh, the robotic printing one each column, uh, each column using um, 16 hours. Um, later, we clean up the, the columns and uh, um, deliver to Shanghai Digital Future um, Kongji campus in 2019. Then we design the, the base connections and the, the top connections. So in the Tongji campus, um, our students uh, help us uh, assembling the full model. Um, we just spend like a few hours to assembling uh, this um, two meter, 2.5 meters height um, pavilion. So here is the final um, results. I think most of you um, went to Tongji have already uh, taken a look at this, this pavilion. Um, and this is the X form uh, 2.0, which is the um, advanced uh, um, project um, compared with X form 1.0. Um, so the similar strategy, um, we divided in this, the, the whole um, pavilion into uh, four pieces and optimize on one quarter of the, um, the pavilion. But um, then we, we add the, the we, we fix the bottom part and add the loading on the top. Um, the normal pressure on the curved roof uh, surface, then run the algorithm. And then you can see then you can see the material has been uh, removed um, and creating the, the, tree, uh, the tree branch um, uh, columns and uh, um, it saves the 52% of the material. So um, we, we design or we create a, a quarter of the prototype, which is four meters high by 2.1 by 1.4. And the full model is the the full size model is four by 4.2 by three. So after we uh, do the optimization, we also do the FDA test. Um, so the new structure of the pavilion meets the actual structure requirement. So compare with the um, 1.0 and 2.0, you can see the, um, the obvious difference. Um, the 1.0 is has just have one flat top, um, but the 2.0 has three different height curved surfaces. Um, later, the similar as a similar um, process, we print a small uh, model, um, one to ten scale, um, to test how if it's um, printable. 
And later we, because we attending the, we attended the um, ISS Barcelona conference. So we need to uh, carry the model to Barcelona uh, Spain. Uh, so we divide the model into 20 pieces. Then we uh, fabricate at MIT Melbourne. Then we um, carry it to, um, to, uh, to Barcelona and uh, assembling um, on site. Um, so just spend the 10 hours. So you can see the, um, the full model um, in the conference exhibition. Um, just two of us to, um, to assemble them on site. Um, so the next project um, is Cloud Flex. So it's the uh, carbon fiber infused 3D printed tectonics. So my contribution is um, the, the, the real time structure feedback during the um, um, design progress. So the algorithm can help um, the designers um, to uh, indicate the, the structural performance um, at the same time when, we, when they are designing. So get the real-time feed, structural feedback and the remapping the, the carbon fiber um, uh, structures. So this is to achieve the best performance and, and adjusting the, the design approach. So this is the final exhibition. Um, it's a, 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 a final exhibition in Shenzhen in 2019. So next project is the cast bodies, which is um, integrating the um, um, two uh, approaches into the project. But this project is mainly um, on the, um, testing the sacrificial uh, formwork um, for the concrete. Um, this project has been um, expected in Melbourne Design Week 2020. So, um, so this project is, is a prototype which can represent the, um, the, the, the large scale of building uh, structures. So this is animation showing the um, casting progress. And this is the, um, the real um, project um, so after also can be, so the mode can be a, a sacrificial uh, formwork also um, can, the mode can be uh, removed. So only the um, concrete structure um, left. So later, like um, uh, Roland and Charlie discussed, we use the MIT robotic to test, uh, to testing, well, well testing the uh, metal print method on the same uh, projects. Um, so Wulunggang University already um, using this model to test the metal print. So next, I want to um, talk about the um, the method I applied into um, into my teaching um, at MIT and also the Digital Future and Casual uh, Workshop. So next movie is showing the um, um, the forming complexity um, uh, design studio at MIT which I um, co-teach with Hassan Mohammed uh, in the past few years, um, using the similar uh, strategies um, to, to represent um, by Nick by the our design, design methods. The studio has been running for two years at RMIT University Architecture School. Nick and some are both registered architects in Australia and PhD researchers in architectural engineering technology. Forming Complexity is a design studio in the territory among digital fabrication, algorithm design, materiality, additive manufacturing, and the structural optimization of complex forms. This studio aims to explore advanced architectural design and tectonic implications of carbon high-tech composite systems accompanied by new fabrication techniques such as 3D printing and robotic fabrication in the architectural context. Now robotic fabrication and 3D printing are rapidly changing the feasibility of constructing geometric structure with a high degree of interest. Therefore, emerging architectural design approaches that leverage the capacity of algorithmic design and digital fabrication methods, such as robotic fabrication and 3D printing, are able to create a highly intricate built architecture in the near future. 
especially in the city of China. Through a series of generative design form finding, a number of designs will be proposed to achieve exceptional architectural qualities such as complex formal expressions, interesting spatial qualities, and innovative digital fabrication methods. The studio will explore a series of architectural components and building systems to reimagine architectural style influenced by the implication of robotic fabrication and high-tech composite materials in other industries such as aerospace and automotive, which have transformed the culture and approach towards design and fabrication in these industries for many years. Students will design a series of architectural components and building systems to reimagine architectural style. New design proposals for the future city will accommodate fabrication constraints as well as aesthetical qualities and planning consideration through developing and testing new intelligent design methods and new construction techniques. So we ask um, students to test the um, uh, Swan, uh, um, Swan intelligent method and the um, topology optimization method on the architecture design process. Also uh, ask them to um, use the adaptive manufacturing uh, method to deliver the, um, the physical model um, using the robotics and the 3D printers. Um, so here's the panels um, from the students and Hassan and myself around the studio quite successfully at MIT. And also we, um, we are also um, uh, teach the digital futures um, workshop um, in Tongji campus um, in 2019. Here is the um, project designed by our students. Um, he used the, the topology optimization method to design the Ch Ch Chinese heritage uh, building. And in 20, Future 2020, um, students um, also designed the Eiffel Tower 4.0 um, in the, uh, online. And in the um, casual 2021, um, Xin, uh, Xinyan and myself um, redesigned the facade of the um, Gaudi's church. So this year, um, besides the, um, the workshop um, and the physical model uh, Roland talked about, I'm also running another workshop in um, Tongji campus. Um, and online, which is called Intelligent, Intelligent Form. Um, we are designing another uh, pavilion in Tongji campus. So the video is showing the um, fabrication progress. And you thanks on um, all the um, colleagues from um, MIT 
And also a uh, special thanks to Antonji University and Digital Futures and give us a lot of supporting in the past years. Um, thank you. Nick, thank you very much for that, um, that presentation. Um, okay, so that, that brings to a close the, um, this workshop seminar that um, we've set up for Digital Futures. And I guess what we'll try to do in this, um, this two-day event was to try and um, begin by showing an overview of, of what it is that we do and what the ambitions and underlying processes and techniques um, that we're developing in the lab are. But then also to be able to zoom in and see very specifically the, um, the detail and the kind of depth of the research that each of the, the researchers within the group are undertaking. And so, um, so thank you very much to, um, to Nick, uh, Natalie and Charlie today. And also um, yesterday with um, Mark uh, and Da Song, it was really wonderful to be able to sort of, you know, expose the kind of research that you, you're doing in the lab and have been doing for a number of years now um, to a kind of wider audience. Um, so if you haven't had a chance, um, I encourage you to also look at the, um, the day one video of this event, which sort of puts a lot of this in a kind of large context. Um, and I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us and um, for taking interest in the work that we're doing at the Tectonic Formation Lab. Thank you. <laughs>